Okay, folks, we'll try this again. Just for the movie, folks, this is um, this is chapter 16, metabolic test. Okay, so folks, we just said for what? Phenol red, good, a pH indicator. And what color, folks, is phenol red at acidic pH? Yellow, Yellow. good. And what color is phenol red at alkaline pH? Red, okay, good. And we said we have to memorize that, right? Um, so folks, the principle behind this is we're trying to answer the question, can my microbe ferment a specific sugar, right? And so what were the three sugars that we tested? Glucose, sucrose. Glucose, good, sucrose, and lactose, okay. So folks, if a microbe is gonna ferment a sugar, it's gonna be glucose, right? Glucose is a monosaccharide, it's fed directly into glycolysis. Okay, so if your microbe's gonna ferment any sugar, it will be glucose. Do you think all microbes can ferment glucose? No, some of them are, like our cells, they're stricter obligate aerobes, so they lack the enzymes to carry out fermentation. So we have to remember that some of them can't ferment even glucose. Okay, but folks, let's say that one of your microbes can ferment glucose. Um, would you presume then that your microbe could also ferment lactose and sucrose? Would you make that presumption? Probably not. And the reason is, folks, remember, sucrose and lactose are disaccharides. So you guys, what is sucrose made of? What are the two monosaccharides that make up sucrose? This is great for the final lecture exam too, folks, kind of a review. So do you remember the two monosaccharides that make up sucrose table sugar? Glucose and fructose, right? So if a microbe is going to ferment sucrose, they first have to hydrolyze the glycosidic bond between fructose and glucose, right? So you guys, what do you think would be the name of an enzyme that would hydrolyze the glycosidic bond in sucrose? What would you call it? Sucrase, good, good. So you guys, for a microbe to ferment sucrose, right, it would have to have the gene for which enzyme? Sucrase, right? If it lacks sucrase, can it ferment sucrose? Nope, it's good. And folks, what about lactose? Lactose is also a disaccharide. What are the two monosaccharides that make up lactose? Glucose and galactose, awesome, you guys. And what would we call the human enzyme that would hydrolyze the glycosidic bond in lactose? Lactase, good. What's the fancy name, you guys, when we were talking about E. coli? What's the fancy name for the E. coli lactase? Good, beta-galactosidase, good, folks. So if your microbe's going to ferment lactose, which additional enzyme must it make? And, and even better would be beta-galactosidase. Good, you guys. Now, if you were a microbe, if you live out in the dirt, would it make sense for you to make beta-galactosides? Where do we find milk? That, that's really the question. Remember, you guys, lactose is called milk sugar, so we're going to find it in milk. Is milk out there in the dirt? No. Where is milk found? Who makes milk? Mammals do, right? We're called mammals because we have mammary glands to make milk for our babies, right? So you guys, um, which group of microbes do you think would most likely evolve um, the gene for beta-galactosides, where would they be living? Yeah, in the intestinal tract of mammals, right? Okay, so that's, 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 that's kind of a key idea. Good job, you guys. All right. So, folks, I'm going to use our little funky butcher paper poster here, all right? So, you guys, we start out, we're going to do the PR sugars first. So, we start out with our um, PR sugar tubes. There's only a single sugar present, and how would you name, know which sugar is present? It's in the name, right? So PR glucose, PR sucrose, PR lactose. Good job, you guys. Now, in addition to the sugar, we have to have an alternate carbon and energy source in case our microbe can't ferment the sugar. So we're going to have proteins, amino acids, also in the medium, is an alternate carbon and um, energy source. We have the pH indicator, phenol red. And in addition, folks, what's this little inverted tube called? And again, you can look at your notes, you guys. It's totally fine. It's called a Durham tube, D-U-R-H-A-M. And what's its function? To collect gases made during fermentation. And folks, which two gases might be made during fermentation? CO2, carbon dioxide, and molecular hydrogen. Now folks, do you think, can a microbe ferment a sugar without making gas? Yes, it, it's, totally, it's totally possible. And you guys, and this is because we haven't discussed all the different fermentation pathways. But in some fermentation pathways, um, 
CO2 and or molecular hydrogen will be made. But in other fermentation pathways, folks, think of lactic acid fermentation, right? In lactic acid fermentation, the, the type we talked about, there was no um, gas produced, right? Okay, so you guys, so what the PR sugar tubes can do for us, it, they can tell us, um, first of all, was the sugar fermented? So you guys, if the sugars were fermented, what's a typical fermentation end product? Think of lactic acid fermentation. What's a typical end product of fermentation? Acids, good. So you guys, if your micro ferments the sugar, what's going to happen to the pH? It's going to go down. And what color should your phenol red turn? Yeah. Yellow. So, okay. So you guys, so if your um, PR sugars, if they appear yellow after incubation, what's your interpretation? Yeah, they, the, your microbe can ferment that specific sugar. Okay, so the appearance is yellow. The interpretation is my microbe can ferment that specific sugar. Does that make sense? How could you tell if in addition to making acids, your microbe also made gas? How could you tell that? Yeah, you're going to look for a gas bubble in the Durham tube. And, and folks, it's sometimes a little bit tricky. Um, when the PR sugars are autoclaved, the, the airspace in the Durham tube is replaced with media. So when you first inoculated your tube, that Durham tube was totally filled with liquid medium, right? So the trick is you want to hold it, maybe angle it this way and that, to see if you can see whether there's a gas bubble in the top of the Durham tube. And sometimes it's a little bit hard to see. But let me, let me tell you folks where you're going to see it. It's going to be in the E. coli tubes. So can everybody grab an E. coli tube with their goggles on and their gloves on? And make sure everybody can see a gas bubble. Okay, because you'll need to be able to do this on the lab exam. Okay. So E. coli is going to be your gas producer. E. coli, it does make both carbon dioxide and molecular hydrogen. So can everybody see that gas bubble? And you might need to move the tape, you guys. Always feel free to move the tape because the tape sometimes can hinder our observations. Can everybody see a gas bubble in the Durham tube? of E. coli. And what what could the gases be, folks? That would be a fair lab exam question. Carbon dioxide and or molecular hydrogen. Awesome. Good job, you guys. Can everybody see the gas bubble OK? Let, let us know later if you can, all right? Now, you guys, with the PR sugar tubes, would you ever want to take one of the tubes and turn it upside down? No, no why not? You could accidentally introduce an air bubble, right? You get a false positive on gas. Good. One more thing, folks. If the sugar was not fermented, you should not see gas. Okay? So you're only going to get gas if the sugar was fermented. Okay? Now, let's think about a microbe, you guys, that can't ferment the sugar, right? They lack the enzyme. Maybe they lack the transport proteins. Maybe they lack, they lack the enzymes to carry out fermentation. They're going to starve. Right? So what's another carbon and energy source in the PR sugar medium? The amino acid the proteins, right? And do you, you guys remember what happens when a microbe tears apart an amino acid? What is released? Ammonia, right? That deamination, tearing off that uh, amino group, it gets released as ammonia. And folks, um, can ammonia affect pH? Yeah, it acts as a... Weak base, that's right. So, so folks, if your microbe can't use the sugar, has to use amino acids, what's going what's gonna to be the pH? Alkaline, right? And what color should the phenol red be? Red, yeah, a deep red color, a fuchsia color. Okay, so let's see here. Um, so, you guys, let's walk through this. Let's compare E. coli and bacill your bacillus, right? That's who we inoculated. Yeah. Could both the E. coli and the bacillus ferment glucose? Yes, yes. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah. Um, did the E. coli make gas? Yeah. Did the bacillus make gas? It did. Huh. Okay. Grr, grr. That bacillus did not read the lab manual. Okay. All right, you guys. So let me, let me introduce you to this, the scoring convention. We have a shorthand for it. Okay. So you guys, on the PR sugars, if acid is produced, the yellow, the yellow phenol red, you put a big A for acid. Like here in our cartoon, you guys, so 
we're going to use a big A for acid. And then we put a slash and we put whether gas was produced, yes or no. We use a negative for no gas, a plus for gas. So, you guys, so in this tube here, it's yellow and there's no gas, so how would you score it? Big A negative. slash negative sign for gas. Good. Was the sugar fermented? Yes, the sugar was fermented. Good job, you guys. Now, another possibility would be, like with our E. coli, that we have acid production and gas. So what would, how would you score this tube, you guys? Capital A slash plus. Perfect. Good job, folks. Now, if your microbe couldn't ferment the sugar, remember it's going to have an alkaline reaction. We can't use A for alkaline, right? So the convention is, folks, we use a K, a K for alkaline, right? So you guys, if your microbe couldn't ferment the sugar and the phenol red is red, how would you score it? K slash negative. And remember, folks, you should never have gas if the sugar wasn't fermented. Okay, now here's a tricky thing, folks, that it is important we know about this because it might mess you up on your unknowns. If you over-incubate your PR tubes, let's think about it, you guys. Let's pretend we're the microbe fermenting. Let's pretend we're E. coli fermenting, say, glucose, right? And we leave the tubes in the incubator, say, for a week, seven days. Do you think eventually the E. coli is going to use up all the sugar? Yeah, it is. And it's going to start starving. So what will it turn to is an alternate carbon and energy source. The amino acids, right? So you guys, here's the trick. You can't over-incubate these PR sugars, right? Don't go beyond 48 hours. Because if you do, your little microbes will start starving. They'll run out of sugar. And then they'll start attacking the amino acids. So after a week, instead of it appearing yellow, how might it appear? Red, right? That would be a false negative, a false negative result, right? Because we over-incubated. Folks, sometimes if you get this alkaline reaction and there is a big gas bubble in there, you have to ask yourself, did I potentially over-incubate, right? Is this truly a false negative on sugar fermentation? Does this make sense? So you guys, what we try to do when you do your unknowns, you're going to be running your unknowns doing these tests. We always try to make sure that we come in and turn off the incubators after 48 hours so that your sugar fermentation test won't over-incubate. Okay. All right, you guys. So now there's one more thing I would like to try to weave together, and that is, um, first of all, to talk about the theoglycolate media. And remember, you guys, we're really careful not to mix um, or shake the theoglycolate media. Remember, the theoglycolate reduces molecular oxygen and creates that anaerobic environment in the bottom of the tube, right? At the top, you guys, is a redox indicator, and I think we're using methylene blue. So it's, I know it's funny, it, it should be green if oxygen is present, right? So we very carefully inoculated our theoglycolates straight down, straight back up, didn't shake them, right? Put them in the incubator. And what we're looking for today, folks, is the pattern of growth. Where are the cells growing? And again, folks, this is really important for the unknown. The reason we use theoglycolates is to answer the question, can my microbe grow anaerobically? So, folks, where should you have really good growth if your microbes can grow anaerobically? Where are you looking for cells? In the bottom, right? Okay, so you guys, what if you have a microbe and there's no... Um, good growth in the bottom of the tube, but there's pretty decent growth up top. Um, is that pattern of growth, does that tell you can your microbe grow anaerobically? No. And you guys, the, the pseudomonas, again, those doggone microbes, they aren't reading the lab manual. At least in yesterday's lab, I haven't checked your theoglycolates. But ideally with a, a pseudomonas, who is a stricter obligate aerobe, where would we expect them to be growing? Up at the top, right, where the oxygen is available. But yesterday, a lot of the folks, the pseudomonas, was actually growing pretty deep into the theoglycolate. And I was, you know, trying to figure out what was going on there. And one possibility might be is if our stock cultures were really young, if our stock cultures were really young, they're in the log or exponential phase of growth. Remember in that phase, of, they're multiplying like crazy. It might be that maybe if we had really, really young cells and they were in logger exponential growth, they went through some rounds of replication even without the O2 being present. So again, folks, on a lab exam, I would never want to give you ambiguous results like that. So on the lab exam, we'll make sure that if um, 
at the station, if we have what we call a stricter obligate aerobe, we inoculate into the theoglycolate. I'll make sure I either have a beautiful tube or a photograph that shows cells growing only at the top, at the air broth interface. Okay, so based on the pattern of growth, then we would say this microbe cannot grow anaerobically, and we would guess it's what kind of a microbe? A strict or obligate aerobe, right? It has to use aerobic respiration to make ATP to survive. Okay, but folks, in contrast, in contrast, let's take a look at our E. coli. So from lecture, you guys, hopefully you remember that E. coli is a facultative anaerobe. If oxygen is present, it can grow aerobically. But if there's no O2, it can switch to anaerobic metabolism, either fermentation or anaerobic respiration. So knowing that about E. coli, you guys, would you predict you should see cells in the anaerobic portion? Yeah, and what did you guys see? Did, did the E. coli read the lab manual? Do you have good growth in the anaerobic? But Oh, that's beautiful, Rihanna. That's gorgeous. Okay. So E. coli, again, you guys, the question we're asking is, can E. coli grow anaerobically? And what would be your conclusion based on the pattern of growth? Yes, it can. Okay, good. Now, one more thing, folks. If, oh, okay. So on the PR sugars, for the results, I ran Pseudomonas fluorescens. And folks, I'm going to tell you right now, Pseudomonas fluorescens, it is an obligate or a strict aerobe. Would you predict, if it's a strict or obligate aerobe, can it carry out sugar fermentation? No. Remember, you guys, Louis Pasteur described fermentation as life in the absence of air, right? So folks, if, if let's presume we had a gorgeous theoglycolate with Pseudomonas, it's only growing at the top, you're like, aha, a strict or obligate aerobe. Would you predict the pseudomonas would carry out fermentation of sugars? No, right? It can't carry out fermentation. So what we did, folks, is a demo. We inoculated the pseudomonas into PR glucose, PR sucrose, PR lactose, and these were our results. Are these consistent with your conclusion that pseudomonas is a strict or obligate aerobe? Yes, right? You would predict they can't carry out fermentation, right? They can only carry out aerobic respiration. Okay, does this make sense, folks? These are some of the integrative type questions we could ask you on the lab exam. And folks, in addition to Audrey Fung's gorgeous metabolic test um, study guide that's posted on Canvas, there's also a PowerPoint, like practice metabolic test questions PowerPoint. So you might take a look at that because it asks some of these integrative type questions, okay? Um, just as another resource. All right, so folks, what we want you to do is in your metabolic tests handout, the horizontal one, you have a table where I would like you to record the appearance of your PRs um, sugars and the theoglycolate, and include an interpretation, meaning what does this appearance tell you about your microbe, right? With the PR sugars, do the results um, mean that your microbe can ferment the sugar or not? With the theoglycolate, do the results tell you can my microbe grow anaerobically or not? Okay. And again, folks, I'd like to see them in color. We've got colored pencils up here. Um, and, and if you prefer you guys to use a separate sheet of paper, like you want more space or whatever, that's totally fine. Just make sure that you're going to be stapling all of your lab results to your lab exam to study guide packet when you turn it in. Okay? And then, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So for the acidic, it can be positive or negative, but for alkaline, it's only negative? Or the okay, so in the PR sugars, mm -hmm. if you had acid produced, that's always positive for fermentation. Right, if your PR tube comes back fuchsia or red, that's alkaline, that's negative for sugar fermentation. Okay. So, so that one can only yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So good point, you guys. So yellow on the PR sugars, yellow is always positive for fermentation. And the deep red, you guys, the fuchsia is always negative for fermentation. They can't ferment that sugar, right? But the yellow could be negative also too, right? Didn't you say that? If I said if that Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I understand. So, you guys, so on the sugar fermentation, like the key thing you're going for, is it yellow, positive for fermentation, or is it red, negative for fermentation? In addition, in addition, you guys, another um, um, puzzle piece is 
if my microbe carried out fermentation, did it produce gas? Right? So the primary, the primary thing is, was the sugar fermented? Yellow means yes, it was. Right? But you can have sugar fermentation without gas production, or you can have sugar fermentation with gas. But this, the yellow, you guys, is key. Yellow is positive for fermentation. Are we okay with that? So you guys, let me, just to make sure we've got it, you guys, so one microbe um, is yellow, no gas. Is that positive for sugar fermentation? Yes. Yeah. You guys, the, another microbe is yellow with gas. Is that positive for fermentation? Yes. Again, it's just some fermentation pathways make gas. Other fermentation pathways do not make gas. Okay? And the simplest thing I can think, folks, is think about lactic acid fermentation that we described in lecture. Do you remember any gas being produced? No. But, folks, what we'll do on Thursday, we'll talk about mixed acid fermentation that E. coli carries out. And you'll see in the pathway, we've got it on the bulletin board there, both CO2 and molecular hydrogen are produced. So it just depends which enzymes the bacteria have to carry out the fermentation, whether they'll make gas or not make gas. So have I totally confused you now? Okay, hopefully not. All right, so you guys, let's, um, let's take some time then to record our results. Um, and then what, okay, oh, with regard to cleanup, sorry, you guys. So with regard to cleanup, folks, with these tubes, please take all the tape off, all the tape off, barely loosen the caps, and then you're going to put your metabolic tests in the kill area, okay? And then, folks, I'll let you work maybe 10 minutes or so, and then we're going to launch into a discussion of our Chapter 17 metabolic test that will inoculate today, and then we're going to read them on Thursday. And Chapter 17 tests are the TSI slant, um, the Invic tests, catalase, and I'm going to suggest you also run a 3% potassium hydroxide test. Okay? All right, guys, so I'm going I'm to stop the movie here. Um, my thought was I'll do the movies only for results, so it doesn't waste your time too much, hopefully. Okay? Um, I, you know, on one of them, you guys, I think I ran out of the inoculation handouts, but I think I have a results handout. Okay. If on the inoculations handout, we'll walk, we'll walk through it together, and perhaps you could.